tonight I'm reading Charybdis. Pushkar, born of lotus petals, home of camel races. It turns out the races have already been run and I missed them. Just last week while I was getting sick in Jaipur, hundreds of people converged on this tiny town to race camels and to watch them being raced. I am disappointed I missed this eccentric des desert tradition, but it's just as well because now the town is quiet, uncrowded, and the air is clean. I try to heal myself by running chi through my chakras like my friend Sanka taught me to do in Vienna, but it offers no noticeable cure. I'm not quite bedridden, but I cough almost perpetually and move a lot slower than normal, and I don't have much energy. But I am still restless, which makes my condition that much more intolerable. Pushkar is another of India's holy cities, with ghats and temples and holy men of more and less reputable pedigrees. I visit the ghats, which consist of many steps leading into a body of water, often a river like the Ganga, where people either bathe for purification or are cremated when they die. In this case, the body of water is Lake Pushkar. According to Hindu legend, the lake was created when Brahma dropped petals from a lotus flower to the earth in this valley. Like the monkey temple, there are holy men who perform rituals at these ghats. They ask how much I want to offer to Brahma in exchange for their services. This is also known as bakshish, which may take the form of a tip or a bribe, depending on the kind of situation that you're in. I'm okay with that, but the priest I meet here skips the formalities of actually offering any services and simply demands bakshish from me just for standing on the steps of the ghats. My cynicism meter moves farther to the right. At the top of a nearby hill, at the end of a very steep climb, sits the Sarasvati temple, named after and dedicated to Brahma's wife of the same name. Still hoping I can beat the chest cold and looking for fresh inspiration. Against all better wisdom, I set up to climb it. Steadily, deliberately, and not in any record time, I make it. When, after great effort, I get to the top, I find the temple closed. I'm crestfallen. I turn away from the locked door and stare out across the playa at the little crescent village on the shores of what I realize from this perspective is really more of a pond than a lake. But taking in the full view from up here, disappointment soon turns to awe. And I begin to feel like I'm a long way away from me. Like I'm living someone else's adventure. For the first time, Pushkar feels like a holy place, a place where magic may exist after all. I have faith in India once more and in my reason for being in here. I sit down and stare out across the valley. The sun is approaching the horizon. I did not think to bring my headlamp with me and I really should be going. But I wanna stay. I sit still a little longer and even meditate on the stone steps. When I open my eyes, the sun is more than halfway hidden behind the small city skyline. And I have to scramble down in the fading light before I am trapped out here in the dark. I like being out here. I like that people are, for the most part, at their best. They are open and alive. Conversation is not small or dull. 
we seem to be able to skip the pleasantries of how's your day and get right to the meat of things. Maybe all travel opens up. Hmm. Maybe all travel opens us up like this. Or maybe it's just that you don't go to India, at least not to a tiny town in the middle of Rajasthan, unless you are a little interesting to begin with, unless your story has some pages to it. <laughs> At dinner, after my climb, I meet an older Jewish man from New York with a heavy British accent who is reading a book by Gita Maya. He sees me from a nearby table with my worn paperback of the razor's edge turned back on itself in my hands and he digs into his bag to hold up a tattered copy of the same. I move over to his table and our introduction turns into a two hour discussion of the search for God in literature. He is, I think, too cynical, but we hit it off. He argues, if I were to meet God, what would I ask him? And what would he really be able to tell me about life and its meaning? Find the answers inside. Here's the meaning of life as far as I can tell. Pleasure. His wife of 17 years died of complications from pneumonia after a long battle with cancer. For some time afterwards, he could find no meaning whatsoever in life. He wasn't even sure why he kept on living. He had other family and friends and work, but death had blacked out most of the windows in his life so that he could not see the light from these things nor find any comfort in their company. He spent a lot of time alone, walking through Central Park, going to movies, rereading books, staring at walls. He's only recently taken a lover, and that has brought the only measure of joy back to his life that he has known in years. When he was much younger, he and a friend spent a month riding trains in India. They had very little money, but second-class fares were cheap, and they could sleep on the trains. The adventure and all of its discoveries from exotic places and foods to new friends to conversations that lasted for whole days was one of the best experiences of his life. He felt more alive during those weeks than he could remember before or after. He booked this trip in an effort to find some trace of that feeling again. I spent a few more days here in Pushkar in conversation with my new friend and taking long naps. It happens that British Jewish New Yorker has a car and driver, and he offers me a ride to Udaipur, where I was planning to go anyway when I felt better. But I'm not getting better. So I opt for a change of scenery instead. The car is also an ambassador, like the one we rode to in Agra. But it must be a newer version because it's more comfortable and it goes a bit faster. It is a relief to be in a car with suspension on a road without 4,000 other vehicles. The pollution is almost non-existent out here in the middle of the desert. That and the open landscape allow me to breathe. Death brings out different things in different people. One of those things is the involuntary gawk response. On the way to Udaipur, on a particularly desolate stretch of road, a very unusual gathering catches our attention and it won't let go. My friend asks his driver to pull over. On the ground is a large animal, a water buffalo perhaps, or what used to be one. Feasting on the carcass are canine predators of various sizes, wild dogs mostly. Sitting in apparent judgment of the dogs, and perhaps the now departed beast, are rows of vultures three feet tall, arranged in large semicircles around the event. They look 
with their dark coloring like a black robed tribunal of death. Or maybe that's a stereotypical vulture prejudice leaking through. And they are actually guarding the soul of the beast until it can be transported safely to the other side. 